So the term radicalization is, unfortunately, it's trending. And I want to know what that means from somebody who's kind of been in there, because I feel like it gets thrown around a lot. And it's it's in danger of maybe losing a lot of the meaning that it has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's good to start with, actually. Uh, radicalization is the uh, normal human psychological process whereby people become increasingly extreme in their views. So it is a process. And the end of that process is that you become an extremist. You, you accept that violence or violent acts in the public s- space are acceptable. And if you act on that, then you're a violent extremist. So you could, be, you could have a process of radicalization which does not end in violence, and then you could have what is called uh, violent radicalization, or you could have, you know, gone through a process of violent radicalization, which does end in violence. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I thought process whereby people become increasingly extreme in their views. I I can agree with that. I mean, not, not that I would disagree with your definition anyway, but it does make sense because you see nonviolent, and you don't think of radicals as nonviolent. You we only kind of really hear about them in the news. But yeah, when I go on not Reddit, but like if I ever look at 4chan or whatever over a friend's shoulder, if you know what that is, it's like yeah. one of those dark oh, webby yeah. type oh, yeah. places. You see people on there and you're like, oh, this person is a toxic mess or these this group of people is horrible and toxic. That, I guess, is radicalization. They're just not doing anything about it, thankfully. Yeah, and we don't want to make the implication that radicalization equals violent. Just like radicals that we know even in our popular culture – uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., it was a, he was radicalized. He was a radical in that sense. He wasn't violent, you know. And then, and then you'll have others who have crazy ideas, and they'll just promote those ideas, but they won't actually act on them. Right. So, yeah. And that's probably fortunate for a lot that's of people. That's what we prefer, yeah. Yeah. You, were you a recruiter for one of these organizations, or was that just something that somebody said? That no, no. It, yeah, I, I, I was... Um, I gave da'wah to, so I gave invitation towards, and that's what we would call recruiting, towards supporting this, this global jihadi culture, not necessarily a specific group, because that global jihadi culture in, incorporates within it all the groups, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. Okay. Okay, so, so you were kind of just like, so I was a supporter support, of that. I of support that. this. Join somebody. Right. I don't have any particular recommendations. Right. Yeah. Why not? Why didn't you pick one group? Not that I'm criticizing yeah. your. <laughs> I, I did. Recruiting. I actually did. I did because in 1996, because my radicalization period really ran from 95 to let's say 2001, but I was kind of on my way off that ramp by 1998 after I got married. Um, but in 1996 is when the war in Chechnya kicked off, and that was the spot that I would always think about wanting to go to as a foreign fighter. Oh, okay. So, so you, I did. I did focus on one, and that was Chechnya, um, but there were other, you know, arenas that were being promoted just the same. So you met your wife in like '98 or something like that. No, I met my I met her in high school in '92. What? Right, '92, '93. So this radicalization thing was like a big parabolic phase in your life because your wife uh, is like very. She's Polish, right, and very. Like, do not look directly at her because she's so white, right? <laughs> like, so, glow like, in the dark r- white. Glow in the dark white. Yeah. And so in high school, you must have been able to relate to women like that. Yeah. And then now you're able to relate to women like that. But during this phase where you're like, okay, super Muslim, she wasn't. So yeah, so it, contradictory. It, it's so weird how it happened because when I met her in high school and, uh, you know, we were metalheads. So everyone, like our friend circles crossed. And then in 95, I have this house party. Um, it gets raided by my uncle and then I go away to India and Pakistan to get super religious. And then when I come back is when she starts, she realizes, wait a second, what made this guy go from this all the way to this? And so that sparked more interest. And then we were just talking, you know, really like we weren't dating. We didn't even like, I didn't even make up with her, man, before, yeah. you know, like we were just kind of hanging out. And then she was wondering, like, why, what is this guy hanging out with me for? Like, what does he want? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, like, how can I get this girl? Like, how can I fit her into my worldview where I'm supposed to be married and she has to be Muslim? Like, how do I do that? So somehow I did. I convinced her or she accepted to marry me. And then, uh, you know, that was 20 years ago. Wow. Five so, kids. Five kids. So something's working. Something's yeah. definitely working. Yeah. Okay. So 
let's back up a little because I know you went to public high school, but you also went to this like kind of strict Islamic school. So yeah. you had two lives as a kid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like uh, being, you know, growing up in Canada, obviously you're going to public school. That's the expectation. Um, and by evening, in the evening time, so from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., I'll never forget, you went to Quran school. Every day? Every day. Every oh, day. Sucks. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Seven days a week? Yeah. There's oh, like, it's horrible. You know, so, I mean, they say even God rested on the seventh, not us. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, keep going, man. Keep there's going. No you got some catching up to do. Yeah. So it was two hours a day, seven days a week, and it was a complete contrast to the caring, nurturing environment of public school. This was the hard, austere, uh, you know, stereotypical madrasa, you know, which just, I mean, in Arabic just means school, but its connotation is, you know, this, uh, uh, like India or Pakistan or Afghanistan, you know, boys, you know, sitting on the floor, rocking back and forth, reading the Quran, not understanding what they're reading. So you're and, just reading it in Arabic, I And guess? just reading it in Arabic. It, it's so weird the way they do it because they they basically teach you how to read it in transliteration, right? So, uh, you know, if, if I was to, you know, write out English letters to sound out, you know, the Arabic, right? So, like, Allah is A-L-L-A-H. Oh, so you're reading, like, Romanized. So we're, we're actually, we're reading Arabic, but we're only being taught how to recite we're not being taught what it means, mm -hmm. and so that, it's rote that, memorization. memorization, and that's and that's a big problem across the Muslim world even today. Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Oh, we kind of right. talked about that outside, actually. Mm -hmm. So this house party, it sounds like you were more or less uh, a normal teenager. You got some metal, some some rock and roll, the devil's music. Yeah, the devil's music. Um, yeah, I was, um, you know, uh, last year of high school, uh, you know, I had already grown up going to house parties, so I kind of ca kind of got the hang of it, yeah. you know, um, and so I just invited everyone over, and, um, you know, this is before social media, right, so it's like, it spreads by word, yeah, and it spreads fast, right, like, it's, it's not as fast as social media, but still, when you hear there's a house party happening, you go, right, so sh that's what I did, uh, my parents were out of town, I had the house party, it was so rocking and yeah then, till yeah. until until that you know stereotypical meanie scowling muslim dude who happened to be my father's older brother it's your uncle then oh, he burst brutal. through the door like a swat team like he, he like the door flew open slammed against the wall and like everybody just like you know just the color just drained from their faces in that split second as they also you know, Run out jet the out the side doors. People oh. were literally jumping off the second floor balcony onto the. Yeah, it was. Oh, it was that's wild. super. Dangerous. Does he wear wild. traditional like? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> you can imagine the long. Like, what's going on, dude? <laughs> you can imagine yeah. the long white robe. You know, flopping back and forth, and it's like, oh crap. And he's yelling, obviously. Oh, the he's whole time. he's losing. Yeah. He's losing it. He's oh losing it. no. So okay. Because I've I have defiled the house, right? Oh, you're not I've allowed brought, to have... I have brought these, you know, kuffar, these non-Muslim, these infidel kids, you know, who are, who are you know, uh, defiling the place with their very presence yeah. and also with the beer bottles and the joints. Yeah, sure. And that sure. didn't help. And so uh, it, was, it was a huge uh, crime in his eyes. Oh, that's so... I can just, you must have felt horrible. I mean, I assume that you got it from everybody in the family for the next month and a half or more. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, uh, you know, he got on the phone. He's calling for backup. You know, he's trying to get the other uncles oh, to come no. by. And, 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 like, I'll be honest, like, there was a stolen car in the garage. No! <laughs> you know, it's, it was a wild house party, all right? And these guys, man, they just, they, 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 they jacked his car and they put it in the, in the garage. And I took off that night because, like, I was, you know, I, did, I panicked. And then, like, I had these guys basically trying to get in touch and saying, yo, dude, like, we got a car in the garage. And so later I learned that they went to the house. My uncles were all there. And the uncles didn't want anything to do with it. So they're just like, take the car and get out. Wow. They're like, so, excuse me, we have to get our yeah, car. And they're like, yeah. no. And they're like, we stole it. And they're like, all right, fine. <laughs> that's go. Ex that's exactly what happened. <laughs> oh, man. They did say, no, it's a stolen car. They're like, okay, take it in out. In that case, get it out of my house now. Do it now. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. What? Okay, so then you'd mentioned. Okay, you decided to get more 
more religious because th- I, I can see your logic. It's here, the though. guilt trip. The guilt trip really yeah. made me feel so bad about what I had done that the only way for me to salvage this is to quote unquote get religious. Yeah, I can I can totally understand the thought process. Like, okay, if I want them to stop yelling at me, I need to double down on everything they want, which is be super religious and conservative right. because I'll right. feel better about myself and they'll get off my case. Right. Like I completely yeah, typical follow kid. that. Logic, but I follow that logic. I understand that. I right, get it. Right. Okay. So, at what point did you? How do you decide to get more into? Or not? How do you decide? Let me rephrase that. So, what is your first step then? You go study Quran more with your uncles, and you're just like, show me the ways, and then <laughs> dot dot dot. What happened? You end up in yeah different place. Yeah. I so I ended up joining a, a group. Uh, it's like a proselytizing fundamentalist group. Um, and what they do is they they don't try to convert other people. They try to encourage other Muslims to become more observant. Okay. Okay. So it's a little different. And uh, they offer this training, if you will, like any let's call it an immersion program, mm-hmm. where f- it's for four months, two months in India, two months in Pakistan, and it's even more austere than backpacking because you're literally uh, staying in the mosque. Uh, you're cooking your own food. You're just like really living very, very basic. And and all you're doing is just self-indoctrinating uh, in these uh, in these ways. And it's praying and it's reading Quran. But none of it is actually studious in the sense like you're still not learning, you know, what the Arabic actually says. So I would have to go to an English translation to, to kind of understand what I was reading, let's say. So it was less uh, intellectual and more behavioral like yeah you know, more devotional sure i could yeah that makes sense you're almost program you're programming yourself you're not learning to like think critically about the stuff right, you're reading right, right and ask questions just blind following that's right. yeah uh, that's um is that so that's what they consider to be more observant not to learn it but to memorize it basically. yeah to go through the the motions right to, to play the part to look the part that makes sense i mean we see that in other religions too yeah. you know you see it with that what's that crazy church I'm drawing a blank because it's a little bit late at night, uh, where they protest soldiers' funerals and oh, stuff. Oh yes, yes, yes. The, the uh, uh, Westboro Baptist Westboro Church. Baptist. Clearly, those people haven't like looked at a Bible and gone, "Oh, you know what? <laughs> this is clearly the interpretation." They're just like, "I'm going to memorize whatever our crazy grandpa or whatever is, right, know, that right. guy, whoever's right. the leader of that, is saying." So, how did you end up starting to get radicalized? Because there's there's a difference between memorizing things and going to the the worst backpacker hostel ever in Pakistan with a, a bunch of other people and then being like, I got to take action in this completely violent and unreasonable way. Mm-hmm. That's a good distinction to make because, uh, again, most people who do get radicalized don't become violent. And for me, what had happened is now that I am in Pakistan, uh, uh, we were sent to a city called Kuwaita. Um, and for those who do know, in the mid-90s, Kuwaita was the stronghold of this newly formed Taliban movement. Uh, so, you know, if you remember, 79 to 89, the Soviets were in Afghanistan. They fought it out. Uh, the Mujahideen, quote unquote, they were the good guys at this time. Then there was a five year civil war after that. And then by 95, the Taliban have come to power in Afghanistan. So I literally ended up walking into one of their areas. Um, and it was a total chance encounter. It's not like I went and I joined the Taliban in Pakistan. That's not what happened. I went and with this group. Uh, who happened to be in the same city with the Taliban. And then I went around just, you know, walking around. Like, part of our thing is to encourage other Muslims to be more observant. Oh, so you're, like, looking for somebody to talk to, a yeah. cigarette and yeah, exactly. hanging out? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yep, and we would say, brother, you know, we've come from Canada and blah, blah, blah. And so, <laughs> I came from Canada here to Pakistan. Let me teach you something about <laughs> right, being Right, Muslim. right, right? Yeah. Exactly. You know how many people said that to us? They said, why are you here? Yeah. We're already Muslim, like. Yeah. Beat it. It's new for you. Yeah, That's right. not new for me. Right, right. right. We've yeah. been here a while, a little while. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, uh, there were also these Taliban members who were around, and, and I kind of chanced upon them. They were just kind of sitting around there. And and uh, the, the spiel that we would kind of give is, you know, to, to, to be successful in this life and the next life, you must follow the commandments of God as shown by the way of the Prophet, alayhi salam, and uh, peace be upon him. And uh, and they said, look, one guy said, well, he goes, if you want to be successful in this life and the next, you do it with this. And he picked up the AK-47. 
And that's kind of badass at that age, right? And and that's that was the moment because this Muslim kid who's seeking this new identity, who's kind of you know, especially this identity of following the the pure religious ways of however they perceive it. It all came together for me. This was an identity that I could buy into, and and that's what happened to me is is when I realized, yeah, you know what, militancy is the way forward because that will because it's strength. It's showing yeah. strength, and especially me, you know, this this young Muslim kid coming from what I thought was a position of powerlessness. Now, now I belong to something much greater. Now I am more powerful. Yeah, I can I can understand that. How old were you at this point? Eighteen. Eighteen. So a hundred percent get it. I a hundred percent get it. I can totally see myself falling into something like that. Especially at that age, you're just being like, "Ah, oh, man, there's I," because you lack purpose at that age. Right. And, and you're kind of being treated as a kid by your parents, maybe society, but you're biologically an adult, but you got nothing really going on. You're like just out of high school or maybe still in high mm-hmm. school. Yeah. Yikes. OK, so it, so then it's September 11, 2001 or September 10, 2001. You said that was your last day as an extremist. What happened? Yeah. And I mean, 9-11 happened. Um, you know, it was Tuesday morning. I was driving to work. I heard a plane hit the building. I was like. Oh my God! You know, I actually said Allahu Akbar. You know, which, contrary to what people think, doesn't mean I'm about to blow myself up. Uh, you know, it, a lot of times it does also mean Oh my God. And then uh, just the events of that day, watching it on TV, everybody kind of sharing in that collective trauma. And then later that day, going to see the bad friends that I was hanging out with because I had left the 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 group that I was initially with, and then kind of came back and joined up with more extreme, more politically vocal. Uh, what what they call Salafists or Wahhabis, Wahhabis. Uh, they were just a lot more in tune with the geopolitical situation. Um, and so he just, I remember one friend of mine and I, uh, or my friend asked, you know, I was like, yeah, but I understand fighting the cause and, you know, in, in combat, how do you justify flying planes into buildings? These are not combatants. These are not military targets. Like, and there was a pause, right? And it's it it's never just one moment, okay? But that was a moment that really struck me because, you know, the guy paused, cu- trying to come up with an answer, and, and then ended up saying, "Well, well, they're all infidel infidels anyway, so it doesn't matter." And you know, both my and then both my friend and I we turned to each other with that, mm, that don't that doesn't jive. Nah. And so that's when I realized that I I didn't know Arabic. I needed to study it properly and formally. And then I would decide to undertake a trip to Syria in 2002 to do just that. Yeah, I I can understand this. I mean, your friends and family were already telling you things like extremism is toxic, right? Like your parents and uncles. Yeah. yeah. Is even the guy who probably kicked down the door of your house party was probably like, "Whoa, man. Yeah. Calm down. Yeah. So I wonder what he felt. He was probably like, "Man, this is partly my fault." Well, it's it's funny because a lot of these people didn't know that I had this change of heart. They didn't. Uh, and it's it's when I started to make known my intention that I'm going to Syria, everybody was like, "Oh crap! Oh boy! You know, we've we've heard of this, you know." And but it wasn't like that, right? And I mean, and even though when I got there, one of the first things I actually did was register with the Canadian embassy, right? Just in case something Just happens. Just in case, right? Uh, which worked out a little bit later. I'm sure we'll get into that, but <laughs> it ended up working in my favor anyway. Uh, then the, the the war in Iraq kicked off in 2003, and I watched as the Syrian regime sent students in air-conditioned buses to go and join the fight against the Americans. I was invited to go, of course, um, but you know, thank God I didn't go. Cause... They just sent over like people yeah. studying anthropology or whatever. And, no, like... yeah. not quite anthropology. Okay. It, it was an Islamic university, okay. uh, definitely Islamic university. Um, and I, I could see there were some really uh, shady people there. Like you could see that they quite a few of them did end up going and none of them came back. Yeah, so, I can imagine that Iraq isn't like, well, we better save these foreign fighters for later. They're like, oh, you're going to show up here? Go ahead. That's right. Save our own boys for that's right. wave two. We'll kill the Americans. That yeah. was, uh, as far as the Syrians were concerned, they didn't care. Yeah, ugh, yuck. You don't hear about too many people going to Syria to get de-radicalized, though. Not, not today. No. Uh, obviously, not since 2010 when the civil war began and uh, the atrocities by the Assad regime you know, are now 
I mean, nobody in their right mind would would go there for for this sort of stuff. No, but Assyria is more with the under Assad is mostly secular, right? Or kind of not secular, but not. Ext- yeah, it, I would call it. I would call it uh, authoritarian secularism. Yeah. 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 So it's they are that. I mean, yes, uh, but they're they're just incredibly authoritarian, which. I heard you mention that you'd said something like, yeah, we're all online complaining about how Canada's turning into a police state. But then you went to Syria and you're like, oh, okay. this is what a police state is really like. Yeah, Got it. Yeah, yeah. So what are you talking about when you say that? Like, what? what yeah, it was, it was really just the disillusionment I felt while I was there in Syria, like studying and being this Westerner and really being this kid who was trying to like force this costume onto himself. Um, and now I'm referring to myself in the third person. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, uh, but 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 that that's basically what 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 happened. You know, they they just kind of it it didn't it didn't work because I was still in a very idealized state, especially coming out of the West, Canada in particular, where where you can wear whatever you want and and you have a right to do that. And if anyone questions you, you stand up, you tell them you're yeah. right. But in Syria, it's not like that. You don't do that. And people didn't look like me, right? Like giant beards were frowned upon, right? The government would actually tell people to come and trim your beard if it was too long. Really? Because they consider that a sign of extremism. But I was a foreigner, so nobody was going to tell me that. Um, but in fact, I was told that, but by the Islamic school teacher. Oh, which, wow. Which really made me like, I thought to myself, how dare he? You know, this is like the the, the beard, like the prophet had a beard, so I got to have a beard. And it's like... You know, later on, people ended up telling me, it's like, well, you know, the prophet also rode a camel, so where's yours, buddy? Yeah. You know, so. I guess they probably tell you to do that because they don't want to be on the radar of the police either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, that whole back to that police state concept, uh, you know, everybody is, you know, if they're not passively informing on you, uh, they're actively informing on you. And so, but I wasn't up to anything nefarious while I was there. And I mean, I was an open book and they could see what I was doing and, and everything was fine. But of course, hey, I'll never forget walking by the uh, Mukhabarat, which is the secret police. And uh, I just waved to the guy and he replies to me, Wa alaikum salam, Abu Mujahid. Oh, he knew you your know, name. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> he knew my name. Wow. I, I didn't know who he was. Was he just standing outside the building? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was just standing there, and he was like, "Hey, I'm Mujahid." What's wow, up? he had memorized you. your. Wow, how many? Uh, well, there there wasn't there there wasn't like I was living in a little town outside of Damascus, and it was just my wife and I, okay. and so they they you know they had never seen people your like us. Your wife lived in Syria too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, yeah. That makes sense, of course. Yeah, we had two kids at the time. Wow, she must have been like, "What did I get myself into?" <laughs> no, she's she's hard. You know, she's um. She's gung ho. She's like, because when we got married in '98, we went on this crazy honeymoon trip. Like we went to Israel slash Palestine and did the Holy Land tour there, and in India and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, like Mecca and Medina, uh, like the religious sites. So she's uh, she's very adventurous and she you know she's cool with that. Mecca and Medina must be interesting. I will never f- experience firsthand, probably, <laughs> but they look really interesting. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. It's the you know literalist, I guess literalist readings that people have where they're like because in in the ancient context it was polytheists who kind of ran that area and then they were basically taken over, if you will. I mean, the Muslims became power, powerful and dominant, and so the 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 edict basically was don't let non-Muslims into these holy cities. Now you know thousand. 500 years later, you know, where we have global transportation and, and you have business people coming there to Jeddah, which is just like 30 minutes from Mecca. I mean, you can get that close, I guess. Mm-hmm. But they, they've taken it really literally. And so they don't, they say like, uh, like it's like on the on the highway, it'll say Mecca this way, non-Muslims that way. Yeah. And you know, it's got an arrow. But it's like, I don't know why. I don't know why they need to do that. I think they, they should open it up to people and, and just experience it because people want to, right? I would check it out. Yeah, I had a friend invite me to Jeddah. I was like, oh, it's really close to, uh, is it Mecca or Medina? 
Yeah, to Mecca. Yeah, and I was like, that would be so cool. And he goes, no, you need a special visa. And I go, yeah. well, how do I get it? And he goes, well, at first you convert to Islam. And I was like, that sounds like it's going to take a lot longer <laughs> than waiting in line at the embassy. Yeah. Maybe we won't do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I could hook you up with like a certificate, a fake certificate. That sounds like a terrible right? idea. But you could get in with you would be able to. You would be able to get in with it. And I'd have to learn. So I'd talk you about would, No, no, I, I'd, give afraid, you that. I'd give you that whatever. Yeah. But it's funny. Some people are like, you know, don't turn it into a, like a tourist haven. Yeah. But it's like, have you seen the Muslims It's got to already be. Have you seen saying. the Muslims yeah. there? It's like there's halal KFC like right there. Like, I mean, like, and people flock to it. Wow. Halal McDonald's, halal Burger King. So it's like you don't want to make it into a tourist haven. Can you get like, you know, how Starbucks has mugs from the different stores. Is there one that says like Mecca in the, in the Starbucks? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't seen be... that. I doubt they'd have that uncovered woman, though, on the cup. Probably, they probably not. have to like black mark, <laughs> yeah. black marker it, it would out. Be, <laughs> give her it would a veil. Be the Starbucks, yeah, but with like a full niqab. <laughs> that's on. right. That's right. That's yeah, right. they could do that. Uh, that might not have the same branding <laughs> effect. All right. So you go to Syria. It's a real police state. What? How, how do you then become uh, working with the the Canadian CSIS, which is I guess the is it the Canadian CIA kind of thing? Is that well, the it's a it, little bit. Um, so FBI more like I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It it uh, so so basically what happens is um, I go through a period of de-radicalization while I'm in Syria. I'm introduced to uh, the Sufi uh, sect of Islam or the Sufi understanding of Islam. They're not a sect. It's more like an understanding. Uh, and, you know, the Sufis are like the Jedis of the Muslim world. And the Wahhabis are like the Sith, all right? Oh, Best okay. analogy. Gotcha. Okay, we both draw from the Force, but one is dark side of the Force. So, so uh, the, you know, I de-radicalized while I was there. I realized that my, my interpretations were wrong. You know, I learned the history properly. I learned the prophetic traditions, uh, went into the Quran in depth, uh, and, and finally became so, like, uh, almost depressed, you know, that I was in Syria. I was like, I was like, man, you know, I just want to go home, you know, and, uh, and and I had this newfound appreciation for the rights that we have in the West, at least in Canada anyway. Um, and I, I can't really comment on the U.S. situation here right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can't throw stones uh, <laughs> in this glass house. So, but, you know, it, it, uh, it I, I, I finished my two years there. I basically... I gave up, you know, in the sense because I had this idea that I was going to stay there for many, many years and not realizing, of course, that, you know, the war that kicked off in 2010, God only knows what would have happened to me and my family. If oh, I was still there. man. Yeah, I don't want to think about it. I mean, the horrible videos that I, I saw already coming out online, I, I just I couldn't imagine if I was still there. Uh, guaranteed, I would have been killed. Uh, guaranteed. Yeah, you, you would have by, gotten by the regime. Yeah. I would have been tortured for years and then hopefully killed. Um, so basically I come back in 2004 to Canada and the first week that I'm back, the first Canadian has been arrested on terrorism charges, the post 9-11 terrorism charges. Mo'min Kawaja was arrested in connection with the 2004 London fertilizer bomb plot. It was the plot before the, the subway bombings. Mo'min Kawaja sat beside me in that Quran school I went to as a kid. Oh, wow. We, in Canada. In Canada. We used to play Hot Wheels cars together. Jeez. Right, he lived on the eighth floor, apartment eight hundred eight, you know, and uh, so I basically I I picked up the phone and uh, you remember once upon a time they had phone books? Yeah, vaguely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I basically found the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and I called him up and I said, Hey, I know this guy, I know this guy, I know the family, and they're like, Oh, you know him? Okay, well, I mean, then someone's gonna come and have a chat with you if that's okay. Yeah, don't move. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just where are you gonna be in the next hour and a half? Is what he said. So basically, the uh, intelligence officer came. I told him my whole life story again, and he just basically put to me the prospect of consulting for them uh, in an undercover capacity and basically guiding them as to who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Wow, that was fast. That seems unusual. They didn't have to, they must have already checked you out if they did that. I would hope so. I mean, uh, I think though they they did see the uh the value that I brought because yeah. I had the ability to access um those vulnerable communities or those uh specific targets that they had in mind. They knew I could get next to those people without any problem. Sure. Because if people did back check me, which they did, you know, I remember you know coming to one place and the guy was like, "Oh yeah. Yeah, we did a credit check on you." 
you know, turn you know everything checked out. Mm-hmm. And I was thought to myself, credit check? Oh. Oh, that kind of credit. Right. Street cred. Street cred. Yeah, not Equifax so, or whatever right. you have up there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, wow, that's interesting. I wonder how they do that. They just go, oh, where'd you study? Oh, that? All right, who do we know that was there? Who knows this that's Apple? Right. That's, yeah, that's yeah, right. Mobine guy. That's right. It's exactly what they did, um, both from the government side and the bad guy side. You know, for the government, it was, okay, check if this guy registered with the embassy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, sure enough, he did. How do you know that was what Ding. the – How oh. do you know that was what did it, though? They tell you? They Well, they told me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he told me straight. He goes uh, – basically what he said was uh, your, your, your background check would have taken much longer had you not registered with the embassy. Because then what they do is they, they, they then ask the local Syrian police to go and find out who, what was this guy doing? Who was he with? What town was he living in? Who was he studying? Oh, uh, sure. And that. So they're cooperating. So, like, hey, just make sure this guy, for your sake and yeah. ours, that this guy's not getting that's radicalized right. right now. That's right. Oh, that's interesting. So it worked out for me because I was de-radicalizing, right, at that yeah. point. Because it would have been tough for them to call Syria after and be like, do you have any info on this guy? Yeah. Maybe. What yeah. do you, what's it to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tit for tat. Okay, so you're kind of, you're trying to go undercover. Or actually, you're trying to vouch for your, old friend who turns out to actually be a bad guy. Yeah. So what were you like? No, no, he's fine. And like, here's all the evidence. You're like, never mind. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it it was, it was more, uh, you know, they were basically saying, look, you know, it's out of our hands, his case, because the police lay charges and the way it works in Canada is the security intelligence uh, component is done by CSIS. The federal policing bit is done by the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in the U S the FBI does both. Okay, got it. So the CIA does what's called foreign intelligence collection. Mm-hmm. Canada does not have a foreign collection uh, of intelligence. At all? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. We we do piggyback off of uh, allies, five eyes, mm-hmm. uh, what's called the ABCA, uh, ABCA Alliance, America, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and, and we do kind of piggyback off of that with, with liaison officers, but we don't have a dedicated uh, agency to do that, like the CIA or... Yeah. Even the Australians actually have um, ASIO, uh, uh, Australian Security Intelligence Organization. You don't have your own spy agency? Dang. I guess you don't really. I mean, if you can piggyback off the U.S., you don't really need to worry about it. Save some money. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what did they have you do then? They're, they they got a, an idea for you. Yeah. It's basically uh, get close to these people and tell us what they're doing. Okay. Uh, who are these people, though? So these people are uh, Muslim, Muslim people who, uh, for whatever reason, have come under some kind of suspicion. Uh, they're online and they are in the mosque. And my job is to basically become friends with them or find out what's happening with them. And I'm not told anything. Uh, if the service has any information on them, uh, I'm not informed of that. And that is to keep me... Uh, honest really uh that there's no bias involved uh that i just you know freely report what i'm able to access so i i was really good at my job and uh, i was able to get in with a lot of people and either verified what the service already knew or denied what others had claimed of this person so for example it was also getting people off of suspicion. Yeah, sure. Because right? they might be like, you know, I don't like that guy. I kind of want his house. I'm going to tell somebody that he's doing something shady and he'll get thrown in jail. Perfect example. There was this imam who was making truckloads of money doing um, Arabic teaching, Arabic classes online. And uh, other imams who were jealous of him contacted the service and said, this guy's Taliban. Damn, that sucks. Right? And it was like, and when it came to Jeez. me, I was like, "What?" I was like, "That dude is not Taliban. Okay? <laughs> no. He's not Taliban." Yeah, that's oh, and man, so that's and then he's like, saying, "Then basically, they told me they're like, okay, well, because a couple of imams are are saying that he is." And I was like, "Those imams are jealous of him that he's making that kind of money and they're not." And they've learned this in their countries that if you do that, because in those countries. Anonymous phone calls do qualify as evidence, and that's sure. it. And you'll be disappeared for years. You hear about that. You hear yeah. about that yes. in um, yeah. Iraq, Afghanistan, Absolutely. Syria. Happens all the time, right? And so thankfully, we, we live in a society, and I would hope we would want to live in a society 
in which you need more than that. You need yeah. more than just anonymous phone calls. And so that's where a person like me comes into Jeez. play. Yeah, okay. So then they got you on these like kids who don't really look all that impressive on paper, right? I, I've looked at the whole Toronto 18 investigation and like the mastermind dude just looks like he played a lot of Fortnite. Well, it wasn't Fortnite back then, but he yeah. played the equivalent, man, like World of Warcraft or something like that. And this attack plan, well, we'll get into that in a second, but there's like this, the guy sets up a training camp in Northern Canada where it looks like kids in snowsuits running around with paintball guns and they're freezing, they're sleeping in their car. I mean, what was that all about? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Toronto 18 case in 2006, what, it, what ended up happening was it started off with CSIS, them telling me, there's a bunch of guys, tell us what they're up to. Now, CSIS already knew 11 days before they sent me in that these guys had a training camp, quote unquote, planned. And the idea was, and so I basically became friends with them, and they basically started to in, try to recruit me, or they were kind of saying, yeah, brother, don't you believe that, you know, the Canadians are, you know, are a, a fair target because of their deployments in Afghanistan and because of what the Americans did in Iraq. And since the Canadians are partners to the Americans, then again, they're fair game. So this was this is the general grievance narrative mm -hmm. that emerged post-2003, really. I mean, even if you look at the Boston Marathon bombings, the guy literally wrote it in blood in that boat. This is because of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so, so those grievances have played a big, a big part in uh, the things that have happened afterwards. The London subway bombings were a result of that as well, or in retaliation slash, slash response. So in this environment, post-2003, these kinds of groups are popping up all over the, the world. In Australia, there was a similar group. In the UK, in the, you know, the Nordic countries, and now also in Canada. And this is what a lot of Canadians couldn't understand, that there were people like this. That what the heck is radicalization? We don't know. Nobody knew. It was a relatively, still a very relatively new term. So these guys got involved uh, online. They were fantasizing a lot about this stuff for five years. All they did was online uh, companionship, basically fantasizing about wanting to do something. And then in 2005, they decided that enough talk, it's time for action. And a number of things uh, were set in motion. Uh, a guy came from the UK. Two guys came, from, you know, in a, in a Greyhound bus from Atlanta, Georgia, up to Toronto. And three guys who were in Toronto, they all met together. And they decided we need to escalate, and we need to. So this became very aspirational. They wanted this. They had this idea in mind, and that idea was basically commit catastrophic terrorist attacks. Now, the, the you know, it, it, a lot of this like them being depicted as these bumbling amateurs, it comes from me because that's what I saw. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm the older guy. I've been exposed to more serious things. Like you said, these guys were kids, and even I've used that term. I mean, they were technically adults in law, uh, but there were four young offenders in law. Like, they were under 18, and they were really kids. Like, this, you know, I made this joke about, you know, one kid who put his – shoes too close to the fire they melted the rubber off oh, of his man. shoes right and or, or one guy bringing a spring tent that we were supposed to stay in and i'm just like what like how are you gonna survive in, in a spring tent like yeah so they're freezing you know and they're and that's why we end up sleeping in the car because i had i kept the you know the the heater on all night because these kids they could die from hypothermia sure. in there and and that's really what what you know I was thinking about is like wait a second like it's very unsafe in that sense, so that's what happened. This training camp was held for like twelve days. We we went up there and and played GI jihadi basically, <laughs> and but the the main thing was this is that they they had some plans right. Nothing was really you know concrete. Um, it, it was it was it was aspirational. Their reach exceeded their grasp. They were not going to succeed in the catastrophic terror attacks that they had envisioned, um, simply because the group had been sufficiently infiltrated. Um, but, but the test in law is not whether you can succeed in a catastrophic terrorist attack. The test in law is, do you have a guilty intention? Mm -hmm. And have you taken steps to realize that intention? Simple. 
And so they did. And I mean, that aspect of the law, at least at its basic, you know, core, mens rea and actus reus, that was yeah. fulfilled. Yeah, because they were smuggling guns up or trying to smuggle guns up, had gotten some guns. You at one point had gotten a rifle for them and then you like didn't give it to them. Oh, right? my God. This I mean, it, just to show you how complex and like on the fly things are. So, you know, this is very early on and December 4 um, and uh, 2005. And the guy the guy calls me, you know, he's like, hey, I need you to come. I need you to talk. I need to talk to you right now. You need to come right away. So I was like, sure, okay, hopped in my car and drove over. And this guy, now unbeknownst to me even, he had enrolled in a hunting course. And the instructor wa- had a store in which she was selling this rifle. And he had his eyes on that rifle. But without telling me any of this, he simply said to me, he said, look, we need to go and go shopping for guns. Can you do that? Because they knew that I had a gun license. So I said, without hesitation, I said, sure. So he replies, okay, good. That was a test because some people were saying that you might be a spy. Hmm. And so there you go. So now it was. A, so now Did look you at how. Did you about that at all? I'd be well, like, uh, well, let, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's walk this through. Yeah. Because look what ends up happening. The next day, we go gun shopping. And we go to three different locations that sold guns. Uh, the first one, you know, they looked at us and we were shady as F. And yeah. <laughs> he was just like happy to get us out of there. Yeah. The other guy just like, yeah, whatever, didn't care. Didn't probably thought we weren't going to buy anything anyway. So yeah. whatever. Uh, and then we got to the store that the lady owned where this guy knew exactly the rifle that he wanted. It was a 22 caliber uh, long rifle, Marlin. Uh, and then he says to me, he goes, oh. Well, here he pulls out a wad of money, and he's like, here's money for I want that rifle, and I want a 1,000 rounds of ammunition. Now what am I supposed to do? Yeah, you have to buy it. I have to buy it. Sure. But I just bought a gun, a rifle, and 1,000 rounds of ammunition. So I thought to myself, all right, I don't know that he has any other 22 rifles. So I said, I'll keep the rifle, and you can keep the bullets. Well, he said I wanted to keep, you know, he wanted both. But I said, no, let me keep the weapon just in case somebody comes to my house to check on it. And so at least I had the rifle, but now That's this guy's thinking. gone. Because you have a gun license, maybe they can actually that, inspect for the exactly, weapon. Exactly, exactly. And so this is the kind of on the fly, you know, by your wits, you know, thinking yeah. that you've got to do. And what ends up happening, of course, is that I get accused of, well, you're the one that bought the gun. Well, you're the one that facilitated right. all of this, and it wouldn't have happened without you. So, I mean, that's the thing. And what people don't realize is that they, they can enlist the assistance of criminals to get illegal guns like they've done it already. So it's not a far cry that they could have done this elsewhere, right? So basically what ended up happening is I had to give them this, give the bad guys, you know, this false story that the intelligence service came to visit my ho- home and they were asking about the rifle. And so when I told this story to them, they were like, oh, yeah, that's because of us because... You know, we're, we're involved in some pretty serious stuff and so blah, blah, blah. It was like a badge of honor. To yeah, them, right? they think they're being tough. They think that they – so, so of course, you know, and then we basically had to come up with a story. I said, okay, look, man, I want to get rid of this rifle. I'm just going to get you your money back, and I don't want to deal with this anymore. But the bullets were still out there, and that's something that at least it, it was manageable, right? Sure. Because the main thing is the rifle itself. Get the weapon off the street. Right. Yeah. And so. And I know that one of the guys had put like a few thousand dollars down, supposedly on some guns from Mexico. So like these guys had intent, and they were they were going after it. Yeah, they they did look. They did successfully bring over at least one gun because that was the one gun that we had with us on the training camp. Oh yeah, the handgun. The handgun, right? And that of course turned into a well, it's it's Mubin's handgun, and it's not my handgun. And what's funny is how for a long time. Probably to this very day that we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, Canadian Muslims, especially those who accuse me of, of entrapment in this case, they think that I'm armed. They think that I have a gun that I carry around all the time. And it's like, guys, I don't. <laughs> but it's like, all right, well, whatever. I'll let you continue. Whatever thinking keeps that. you safe. Yeah. But it, it just it just kind of showed how this is what you got to do. Right. Like sometimes it's a test. And like if you blow the, your cover or like you you remove that undercover element they go dark and you lose contact sure which is scary and, and then you you don't know how long it's going to take 
before something ends up happening. And we don't have the luxury of doing that. So a sting operation ma- basically manages the close of that investigation yeah. by arresting them and then... Because their plan, your, what was your plan? Your plan was, or their plan, not your plan, but... Yeah, so there's like, some confusion here. So I- initially, let's call it a, a, a large uh, aspirational generic plan, all right? Okay. And that is basically blow s***, all right? Yeah, Somewhere. Yeah. Simple. But then it becomes more specific. So the one really fantasy plot was attack the parliament building of in Canada, uh, in the capital city, Ottawa, uh, take the members of parliament hostage and begin to cut their heads off one by one and force the eviction of Canadian forces from Afghanistan. We joked about how we would put snipers um, so that if anyone came, we could obviously take them out. There was another, again, just going through scenarios. Could we have car bombs go off in the city to draw the attention of first responders and distract them while we stormed the parliament? So that was one plot. But then what happened is the group kind of split because Zakaria Amara basically began to think that Fahim Ahmed was a big bullshit. So one um, one of the guys thought the other leader was just kind yeah. of full of crap. Yeah. It's it's very similar to a gang scenario where it's like don't follow that guy. I I'm going to be the leader now, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I'm the captain now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, and nice. then what happened is he yeah, basically no. took a smaller group of guys and they developed a plan to to detonate three 1-ton ammonium nitrate truck bombs. Okay? And and the Oklahoma City in uh, the Oklahoma City uh bombing, the Murrah building. That's what a one-ton ammonium nitrate truck bomb does. It, it takes the whole half of the building right out. So that was their intent. And they, and they, they thought of three locations. Um, the first one was the uh, CSIS building, the intelligence office. Um, of course, underneath it, so if you were to put that bomb on that road, it wouldn't just take out the building above it. It would take out the pedestrian pathway beneath it. The Toronto Stock Exchange was the second target, and that was to uh, the economic target. And, and also, one of the guys uh, may, wanted to make false investments, fraudulent investments, oh, yeah. and make money off of that attack. To, like, short the market yeah. and then And then profit. the third target was an Air Force base where our fallen soldiers are repatriated uh, because of the psychological impact of killing your guys a second time. And so that's what it ended up becoming. Wow, jeez. So that is really like despicable plan. And that's the thing, right? Yeah. Like I, I'm not going to, although I, I've, and I've said publicly because I, I'm, I like to be honest when it comes to that, I don't like to exaggerate or embellish. They would not succeed in this attack. They it's would, a complicated attack. You're going to attack the it, it, it would, it would, intelligence it, yeah. headquarters. I mean, like yeah. no one's looking for that kind of chatter and everything. Exactly. And and you do not just you know you, you know one does not simply come up with a yes. one ton of ammonium yeah. nitrate. Right? Hey, uh, Amazon. Oh, go on Amazon right. and order every bag of ammonium nitrate <laughs> well, that you can find. <laughs> well, what they did, they thought they were smart, but they they created a false company called Student Farmers. And they printed T-shirts and business cards and a website because, you know, that's all it takes, right? Right, yeah. I mean, you don't think they're looking for people ordering one ton of yeah. ammonium nitrate? Sir, someone just ordered one ton of ammonium nitrate. Well, check them out. Well, they did print T-shirts that said they were student <laughs> farmers. Right. Nah, that's fine. Let, right, it, right. let them have it. Can't so that, so and, and we do laugh at it because it's like it's impossible that they could have succeeded. But, but look at. The seriousness to me is what they fantasized. Yeah, yeah. What they saw happening in their head was just macabre is what it was. It was well, it was macabre. If they couldn't have gotten the fertilizer because the order got dinged and they didn't get arrested, they would have just figured – you can go to the mall with a bunch of swords and start ca- hacking people up, and you can still do damage. I mean, at some point, you're just going to do something horrible. Well, and, and that's that's a good point because, I mean, what what does happen, right? When they realize that, well, I can't achieve that, well, they just completely abandon all plans whatsoever. Yeah. Guess Likely I'll go to not. college now. No. Exactly, exactly. Because even we, we know, I mean, uh, certainly the Americans know, like w- just one pistol, one pistol, 15 rounds. I mean, how many people you can kill with yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Right? Or more pistols or a long rifle with 900 rounds of ammunition. Yeah, start a fire at so, a stadium What's full of people. That, 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 that was the thing is that it, even though that was – a plot that they could not have pulled off. They could very easily have just dropped down a few notches and, you know, kind of, you know, taken the loss and go with a, a less spectacular attack, but still kill people. So 
They certainly were of yeah. that mentality, right? I do wonder, though, when you guys were at that camp, weren't locals kind of surprised that a bunch of, like, super Islamic-looking dudes are hanging out in the woods and then, like, popping into Tim Hortons every few hours to pee and get a drink? Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was really funny because there was actually a... We went to this no-frills to get, I think, tuna. And uh, and it was like we were in, like, Whitey McWhiteville, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, like, these brown-bearded camo-wearing... When we walked in, it's like you could hear the pin drop. And, like, the <laughs> necks just go... Whoosh! Like, what is this? So, I mean, we, we did come to realize... Or we... Well, it, it became public knowledge afterwards that, in fact... The police had told the neighbors that listen, they are being they are being watched, and don't engage them, don't confront them. There was this like hermit dude who kept coming out and saying, "Hey guys, what's going on?" And just like totally, he seemed like he was just spaced all the time, like out of it, super high. I don't know what it was, but he was just like, "Hey guys." Because, you know, sometimes a UFO lands over there and, like, he just really got us going. Oh, he's mentally... Yeah, there was... I don't know what, but, you know, he was just this really... This eccentric figure who was a local. And uh, he just just didn't bother us. There were some snowmobilers who were kind of like, Hey, what are you guys doing here? You know, this is like Joe McDonald's land. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, Not realizing, like, we were basically squatting on this guy's property. But... They were basically told, just leave it alone. We're watching this and carry on. Wow. They must have been, yeah. So they they knew, oh, man, they must yeah. have just been. That's the biggest thing to ever happen up there in yeah. northern oh, Canada. Sure. Absolutely. So you bust this plot wide open. The, the kids get arrested. There's a video of it. We can link it in the show notes. They basically, they're like unloading all these fake bags of ammonium right. nitrate, which are probably rock salt or something. <laughs> and then these armed SWAT cops come in and bust these dudes in student farmer T-shirts, Yeah, which cover all. Damn it, the T-shirts didn't work. (laughs) Um, Your dad finds out because he sees you on TV. Must have been. Yeah, I actually told him in advance. I I did tell him before that show aired because he does watch that show religiously. And uh, I did tell him, yeah, I did tell him right before the Wait, show Wait, he started. watched which show? It was called The Fifth Estate. Is it like uh, a news show? Yeah, it's like your 60 Minutes or oh, yeah. 5 Oh, right like, yeah. And um, I basically told him, I was like, listen, you heard about the arrest that happened of all those guys? Because the arrest happened early June, and I gave my interview in July, basically. And so I said, listen, you heard about these arrests. I'm the undercover on that case. And he just looked at me, and he was just like, Alhamdulillah, you know, I'll praise you to God. Tell them to give you a full-time job now. <laughs> you know, that, that was his thinking, and right? And they did. <laughs> right? So I was like, what? Mm, yeah. Well. That was the first thing he said? That was the first thing he said. He was like, tell them to give you a job. Alhamdulillah. But uh, I, I think he then very quickly realized, wait a second. <laughs> you know, because yeah. now that it became very public, the impact of that started to be felt. Sure. And, you know, he is so respected in the community that I think maybe I'm sure a few people did tell him that, hey, your son, what your son did was not good. Yeah. And he just didn't tell me. Sure. To hurt, you know, so not to hurt my feelings. Uh, but he claims that most people said that what your son did was right. And, you know, you should be proud of him. Well, that's blah, blah, blah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's got such cred in the community that nobody even tried to blacklist him. Like, they totally blacklisted me. Don't get me wrong. To this day, I, I get You're like, like not oh, yeah. invited to the I'm wedding. I'm persona non grata in a lot of these things, right? Which is fine with me because I don't have time for their biryani dinners and, you know, where they backbite about other people. Like, I don't got time for that. You have five kids. I you got have five for kids. Anything. I got my own life and, yeah. like, and, and things happening. So, but they didn't even try to do that to him. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't get whacked is because the people who could basically call for me to get whacked know my dad very very well yeah ooh, and they'd just be like they will just be like no you know what okay we you know it's bad what he did and we don't agree with it and he ruined these kids lives but uh you know he didn't kill anybody and yeah and whatever so i mean you didn't ruin their lives you were you got the they ruined their they own lives they i mean died in that attack well so. they, again they wouldn't have even been able to succeed in that yeah. attack or even if they would have you know moved on to some other attack Right, maybe less of a spectacle, but still lethal. Uh, but but again, like that was 
irrelevant to me. Those are all secondary yeah. factors to me. It's like you want this is what you want to do in in a city that I'm born and raised in, in the name of my religion, right? I'm not going to allow that to happen. I don't care what people say. You know, those things alone that you want to b- up in my home and use my religion as a cover, not acceptable. Yeah, not, not acceptable. on my watch, I'll, right? I'll end your life if I have to. I mean, I think it probably surprises a lot of people. Another thing that surprises a lot of people is that all this radicalization thing, this hits all social strata. It's not like broke-ass, right. poor people That's from right. nowhere. There That's are right. people that go over there where you're like, wait a minute, your dad's a lawyer, your mom's like a yeah. surgeon. Yep, middle then, class, educated. Yeah. They have stuff. You know, it's funny. I, I do this presentation because uh, I train U.S. Special Forces now uh, on ISIS, especially those who are you know going to deploy. And I have this whole section. And, and on one of my sections, I have these photos of – Food pictures that ISIS guys were posting. I noticed that. I, did, I was searching did on Twitter, and I was uh-huh. like, I was looking for what jihadis were talking about. A lot of it's in Arabic or whatever. <laughs> I can't read it. And then I look at stuff, and I'm like, is that a kebab? Like, what is, is that a freaking shawarma-looking sandwich? And I, I, it was funny to me because I'm thinking, okay, there's a lot of pictures of food. But what's going on here? ISIS members are freaking talking about the pictures of their lunch in Raqqa. Like, just... <laughs> It's like jihad meets like some hipster from Brooklyn, like some guy from a high school who now is making bespoke kombucha in his apartment in Williamsburg. And yet these guys are also like, they're like, we're going to blow up and shoot a bunch of stuff. Also, we have kebabs. Yeah. Look at this fresh goat we just slaughtered. It was just kind of surprisingly, uh, it was surprisingly human in a way. Like everybody well, takes pictures of their food, even ISIS. Yeah, yeah. I mean... In those days, what was happening is they were trying to recruit people to get them over and join their them in their lands. And people were afraid that, am I going to be able to eat the way that I ate? So they would put out these recruiting posters. It's like, kebabs? Yeah, we got that. And there's a picture of nice kebabs, you know what I mean? And then it's like, how can I not take a picture of that? And it's like a milkshake. And then they have like frappuccino from Starbucks. Or Nutella was a big thing. There was like this whole thing with ISIS and Nutella. All right, if you like your listeners right now, if you were just to go and Google that, go, go and Google that right now. ISIS and Nutella, you'll see the kind of stuff that came up. And and in one of those pictures was really, like you said, cutting across social strata uh, and, and everything. This Indo Pakistani, so like, you know, Indian subcontinent uh, in the UK, British citizen in Syria. Referring to pizza as home food. He's like, home food, how I missed you, and it's pizza. Wow, the irony, man. Right? And it's like, and but what that told you is these guys, these people, they are products of the society they grew up in. They can front all they want and, and wave their placards and their flags and their slogans, but you are products of the West. Yeah. If, if I can flip the script a bit, there's a, uh, a woman, female, who admitted, she said that all I wanted to do was get my piece of eye candy. And basically, she was. Oh, she re- went there for. A she, she, no, no, she didn't even go there. She was watching these jihadi videos, and seeing these guys with long hair, big guns, <laughs> and 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 the phrase she used was, "I wanted to get my piece of eye candy," and, and we laughed because it's like we use that phrase. That is purely what a yeah, yeah. purely Western phrase, and but it shows you that, you know, it kind of also shows you that these are young kids or maybe young adults who have been told to suppress their sexuality where they can't even interact with members of the opposite sex without it being framed under marriage or virgins in heaven after you blow yourselves up. It's like, dude, just get a girlfriend right here on earth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You preferred. Yeah, definitely. What type of people get radicalized though? Like are there, all there's gotta be backgrounds, male, female, rich, poor. Yeah. You name it. White, black, Asian. You've got these four factors, though, like geopolitics or ideology, yes. uh, money, adventure, frustration. Can you talk about that a little? You don't have to go into too much detail, but th- that was an interesting combo. Yeah, let, let's. I mean, basically, there it's always a multiplicity of factors. Uh, there's a great quote um, by Peter Neumann. He's the founder of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. It says, ideology without grievances doesn't resonate. And grievances without ideology are not acted upon. All right, one more time. Ideology without grievances doesn't resonate. And grievances without ideology are not acted upon. Another quote that's mine is, sometimes religious ideology is indeed a driver 
for violent extremism, but at other times just a passenger with other psychosocial factors at the wheel. Okay. And so that will include then your sense of meaning and belonging, needs. Uh, uh, the geopolitics falls under the grievances, mm -hmm. so wars that are happening in different lands. Because people ask, you know, why do they hate us? Well, you've been bombing them for yeah, decades sure. and decades. You're destroying their societies. So what do you think is going to emerge from those societies if not extremist thinking? Yeah, right? of course. So, right? so yeah, the frustration, the, the geopolitics, and the ideology. Exactly right. So the, the the these are the things that relate to, and why I put, you know, like poverty, for example. People say sometimes poverty is a factor, other times it's not a factor. What you got to look at is every individual in their context, and look at every factor relative to that individual in that context. So ideology could be prevalent for some person, some people, and it just be a secondary factor for somebody else or for some right. other people. Right, like some people who have nothing will, might go for the money because they're just like, whatever. That's right. But other people are going, no, I'm here for the ideology. I don't That's care right. about the money. But also the adventure is kind of cool because I'm 18 and I'm bored off right. my ass. Yep, yep. Yeah. That now, the sense. opportunity to go from zero to hero overnight. Yeah. And yeah. How, how, how intriguing, how enticing is that for a young person who sees himself as a zero, right? Just living at home, doing nothing. What do you look for when you're like, hmm, uh, well, actually, let me rephrase that. What can we look for, it, our, pa our parents or friends? Like, what am I looking for if I'm like, is this person doing some radical weird stuff? Like, maybe I wouldn't have somebody like that in my circle, but maybe there's like a Muslim kid or a Muslim parent who's like, my kid is being weird. They're on the internet. I don't know what they're doing. Right. What do right. they look for? Yeah, it's a very, uh, very good question. Uh, very timely. Look, it, it's, it's, you know, sudden changes in behavior uh, are the biggest warning sign. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially extreme changes. Now, just because, you know, your, your daughter comes home with a hijab or, you know, your, your son decides he's going to convert and wants to grow a beard, that in and of itself is not a sign of extremism. You have to look at clusters of behaviors. So when you start looking at unequivocal black and white thinking, where especially where you begin to demonize others, mm -hmm. so it's like believers and disbelievers and kufar, right? Well, now it's like you're really demonizing people who don't believe in your religion, right? It's something to say, oh, they don't believe in my religion, right? Like, okay, we have a difference. But versus anyone who does not believe what I believe is going to hell. Yeah. Right? Now, even that, that's like you could say even that's extreme conservative thinking. So let's look at more clusters. And really, ideology is going to be a big kicker in that. As soon as you start to justify or sympathize with certain activities or certain actions or saying, well, you know, this is okay what they're doing because well, then now you're starting to get into sympathy and, and then that starts to lead into membership. So you might obviously look to see, I mean, is this person carrying around ISIS paraphernalia or is it Al-Qaeda paraphernalia or I don't even know what that is. Who do I call? Yeah. Right. So if I can just give a quick shout out and open plug in, uh, to a group called Parents for Peace. Uh, they're at parentsforpeace.org. And it's it, there is a line for parents, a 1-800 number that they can call where there are people that will actually talk to you. Uh, so, th so there is some assistance in that regard for that. Um, but uh, really, like I said, ideology is the big one. Look to see what sect that they are either converting to or you know something along those lines. And that will be a good a good start in terms of uh, seeing what your kid is actually up to. Because the last thing you want is the FBI basically, you know, breaking down your door and hauling your kid out. So you talk to some of these extremists online right now and try to kind of debunk their BS. Is that one of the one of your hobbies now, I guess? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, basically what happened is after, after like the Toronto 18 court cases were done in 2010 and this whole ISIS thing really started to kick up in 2012 and lasted for a number of years. Yeah. And in those years, what I was doing from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, I was online every day uh, with these people trying to – engaging them, directly engaging them, trolling them, uh, responding to them, using you know Islamic sources to counter their uh, deviant interpretations, uh, training government agencies in trying to do the same thing, um, uh, obviously not to the level that I was doing. So I did do that for an, uh, several years, day in and day out. 
I stopped doing that because I just got fed up with it, to be honest, right? Um, and it it just it took so much out of my soul, you know that like because they they're so needy, you know they they, they require so much because they're especially those who are young kids like the young recruits uh, and 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 ideologues or or you know professed acolytes of ISIS, they were just like hours and hours of the day, and I'm an adult, I have a life, I have yeah. a family, I have like things that I got to do. And it's like, but it, it just sucked up so much of my time. Right. So I did do that for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, ISIS has, was, was, you know, largely, uh, defeated. I'm going to put that in air quotes because they're not defeated. They, they are going to rise again. They've just kind of gone into hiding and laying low until a more opportune moment. Uh, but that is what I did in that time. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like you, you, I mean these a lot of these people are loners with like no friends that are finding their community online. So yeah, you going, yeah. "Hey, look, I got to go eat dinner with my kids." They're like, "Well, I'm going to be online for another 7 hours. Yeah. I have nothing to do." I would do that deliberately, you know, I would say to them because I would make them wait for me to come back. Yeah. Because they were like dying. They want they, that's all they do. They were they were online all the time. And it's like, "Oh, okay. Well, I have a life now, so I'm going to go and I'll be yeah. back in a few hours." You know, and just kind of tease them like that. So, How, what's the volume of discussion and recruiting? Is it like hundreds of people, or is it like thousands of people are online recruiting other people, recruiting kids for ISIS? Now it's, I mean, the whole recruiting for ISIS thing uh, has really has 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 plummeted. Is really the word uh, in 2012 when it's just started to kick off. Uh, 2014 is really when it started. Uh, 2015, it, it escalated. The attacks began, ISIS attacks. Uh, the first ISIS attacks happened really at the beginning of 2014, but late 2014 because mid-2014 is when they declared their caliphate or their caliphate, as I call it. Mm. Uh, and then 2015 was even more. 2016 was more than that. 2017 was more than that. And then by 2018, it started to come down. So those are the years in which it really starts to peak. And what they were doing, and there have been some studies done on this as well, on how they, you know, amazing use of technology, use of bots. Yeah. Uh, they, they did that hijacking hashtags. So they would come on World Cup during World Cup and ISIS and beheading video. And then you who's kind of scrolling through, it's like, oh, ISIS beheading video. Oh, let me check that out. Da, da, da. And then you go further down in the rabbit hole. Uh, and, and people were, so this was like a trawling almost, right, that they were doing. So there were thousands of recruiters, but a lot of them were bots. Oh, interesting. Okay? So, yeah. so there were a few, there were a core group of recruiters who were putting messaging out. That messaging was being amplified by followers, by electronic account, like bot accounts, and that is how it did spread far and wide in that time. What's interesting is that I, we kind of watched uh, how social media gave platform to these people and allowed them to recruit openly in yeah. many cases. And it frustrated the hell out of me that, that this was allowed to happen, that yeah, kids, are, kids are being recruited, that it's happening. Here, look, go and, watch and see it happen. But what's funny is that I, I spoke to a CIA friend of mine who said basically, um, you know, if we just turned out the lights – then they would just go dark and we wouldn't know where they're going, who they're going with, where they're staying. With allowing these guys to talk, it's like, okay, a few dozen people get recruited. Mm -hmm. But you know what this does is it opens up the door for hundreds of them to be compromised. So right. you what's can, the trade-off? You can monitor and, and try to... And so, that, and so that's what ended up happening. So... Um, so that that that's that's what happened with the whole recruiting thing, anyway. How do you de-radicalize? I mean, you kind of did it by seeing the September 11th attacks, going to Syria, learning stuff. It's kind of hard to go, oh, you know, you, some of your beliefs are wrong. You should do this multi-year self-education so that you make sure that you're right and find out that you're not. You know, I try liken uh, attempts of uh, to de-radicalize people like trying to convince somebody to change their political stripe. Yeah. Think about how difficult yeah. that is. So um, almost impossible. It is. It is. And and that is what you're looking at with de-radicalization. Now, unfortunately, in this context now, we're dealing with a lot of individuals who are in custody and so or have been arrested. And so that de-radicalization option is really under coercion, right? 
And so it's hard to know if they're sincere about it. Yeah. How do you know? And, and I've taken recently a harder line on de-radicalization. It is not a magic bullet. It's not something that it's assumed or automatic or whatever. It's extremely difficult. And and one of the things, like I'll mention only, you know, some things because I don't want to give away all because these guys will deceive you. Right? Yeah, they will sure. tell you what you think you want to hear so that you will give them the check mark of de-radicalized and then maybe get a lesser sentence and maybe get out sooner. Um, but, you know, basically you have to look to see, you know, the you know, changes in ideology, right? Change in religious practice, right? How do they see Islam? How do they view the world? How do they view those who are not like them? There, these are there. There are nuances that you want to be able to look at, and really, the best way to do this is using former extremists like myself. Um, even in some cases, in Germany, they have uh, because in Germany, the de-radicalization of white supremacists is actually what began this whole de-radicalization thing. Hmm. It was in Germany in the 80s where people were leaving neo-Nazi groups, and then the principles of that were now transferred over to uh, jihadists. And so in uh. Germany, you have an ex-white supremacist who actually counsels jihadists. That's got to be an odd and, couple and so, hanging out. Yeah, and yeah. it just kind of shows you. So, so now you know. Now, now we're we're doing a um, you know we're we're trying to get uh, a more formalized system in place. You know, my my friend, our our mutual friend Brandon Blackburn. Um, you know, we've been actually trying to work with State Department to train other countries how to conduct de-radicalization and how to conduct training for some of these uh, government agencies because uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, they, they, there are tens of thousands of, of foreign fighters who, who are going to return back. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm literally working on an article right now. Uh, I actually do have like the most up-to-date numbers for the U.S., um, and um, on how many foreign fighters? Yeah, there? actually, um, if, if you got a second here, yeah, I'll yeah, give you the. Time. This is actually the freshest information available right now. So, three hundred in total tried or succeeded going to Iraq or Syria. Americans from the United States. Wow, eighteen are back. Eleven males who were charged, two males who were not charged, plus two females who were charged, and three females who were not charged. So, uh, thirteen males and five females, at least in addition, okay, so that's 18, plus at least 13 children. Uh, that they've had over there. That are back. Yeah. Oh, that are back. Yeah. Oh, wow. So like the hundreds of people. So that's what you're dealing with in the U.S. These are relatively low numbers. I mean, you know, the, the U.S. is so far away. Just yeah. like Canada, we're dealing with fewer numbers. I mean, I think there's like 30-some-odd um, uh, in custody right now. Uh, uh, six who are men, nine who are women, and 17 who are children, most that are under the age of five. That, those are small numbers. Now you start to go over to the Middle Eastern countries where you're dealing with thousands of people. Wow. Germany, Belgium, even Europeans, because it's yeah. very close proximity, and so for them, they were able to go. So that, that's the situation we're, we're dealing with now, facing the prospect of these individuals going back to those countries and basically waiting to see what happens Jeez. in the next few years if they if they kick off. What kind of programs are there for jihadists who come back to their home country and are like, all right, I'm, I should probably de-radicalize? Or they're not even thinking that. They're just like, eh, I'll chill in America because this ISIS thing's not working out. Syria is a mess. <laughs> well, the U.S. is really good in the sense that their material support of terrorism um, charge is very broad and allows them very easy prosecutions in that regard. Other countries, not so much. Uh, Canada is struggling. The UK is struggling, especially Commonwealth nations. Uh, Australia are struggling to charge these individuals because it's very difficult to get evidence of war crimes in a war zone. Sure. Uh, so it, they, a lot of, in a lot of these cases, these individuals are not being charged at all. Do they need? Does everybody need to be charged? I mean, look, maybe I'm naive, but some of these people are just dumbass, eighteen-year-old kids. Well, probably yeah. Like, wow, I'm so glad I'm not there anymore. The place sucked. Well, we need a triage process yeah. to, de to to determine who those people are, because I submit that it is a colossal failure of our legal system that we can't charge these people, because you're basically telling them you got off. You yeah, got sure. off of being part of a you know, raping, mass murdering terrorist group. And what message does that send to people? Does it dissuade them? I don't know. Of course not. It's no. not going to dissuade them. They're no. going to think they're protected by Allah because yeah, the look. kufar can't touch me. 
Oh, you know, man. I killed, I shed blood, and nobody can charge me? I right. mean, that's like, so why would we go out of our way to repatriate these people? At least in the U.S., they're getting significant jail time well, in some cases. I mean, there is one guy who was captured by the Kurds in Syria, and he was like a total, like, dumbass, okay? Like, <laughs> you know, the way that he spoke, like, you could see, like, his Arabic wasn't good. Like, he would be somebody that I score low on the on the threat and risk scale, he got 20 years. Oh, jeez. And that's 20 years time. in a U.S. federal prison, Yeah, that's an appropriate sentence in my view. Yeah. Now, I mean, in some cases, like in Canada, we had a pretty big one, like nine years given to one guy. I was actually surprised at that case. That was one of the higher um, sentences given. Um, uh, but a lot of these other guys, they're getting just not even getting charged, right? We have a yeah. guy who came back. Uh, he was part of a uh, New York Times podcast called Caliphate yeah. by Rukmini Kalimaki. Yeah, cool. Just fantastic. So interesting. Fantastic. We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, great, because I'm featured in, I think, episode five. Are you? Oh, yeah, so yeah, I've yeah, already yeah. heard you. I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. But Abu Huzaifa, the Canadian who was featured in that, the guy admitted to killing two people. Yeah, I know. I uh, and uh, we know who he is and this and that, and he wasn't charged. Uh, nothing, right? And in fact, he bragged about how the kufar can't touch me, this, that, and the other. So so that's that's the dilemma that we face, right? And so some of these people, truly, if we want to bring them to justice, that means uh, holding them accountable for the crimes that they committed, not just crimes that we can charge them with that we can prove in a court of law. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, look, it's a different game, right? It's a war. Yeah. Are you worried at all about retaliation now that extremist groups, you know, you've sent some of them to prison, uh, you've actively, you are actively trying to foil their terror plots. That's never a good way to make friends. You're online messing with their recruiting efforts. Like, wh- are, are you worried about these people at all? Look, I, I, uh, I, I do use, you know, ghosting software, government issue ghosting software. So basically, hide my uh, my locations Tour. and whatnot. Yeah. And, and they did in those years anyway when I was that active. They have put out warnings against me on their Facebook pages. Yes, they had Facebook pages. Uh, that were eventually shut down. Um, they actively tried to find out where I was, and even on Twitter, they were trying to. They would post photos of some poor sucker's backyard in New Jersey, because that's where my, you know, uh, my IP address showed my location to be. So I do take steps to uh, avoid detection by them, um, and they got. And the agencies are also watching out for me, sure, so yeah. I'm not. I'm not too worried. Well, thank you for your work keeping us safe. And uh, good luck. We'll see you on Netflix, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I uh, want to give a shout out to FusionIntel.com, of course. Yeah. Uh, Brandon and I have been doing a lot of good work. In fact, I would like to say, you know, one of one of the uh, a high priority mission that we are working on now is to actually repatriate one of these children back to the custody of her father, uh, from which she was stolen and taken uh, and basically kidnapped. Uh, to join ISIS and has been, you know, captured by the Kurds. So, yeah. so that's what we're doing nowadays. Man, I, uh, I saw on Vice there was a guy whose wife bounced while he was on a business trip. Uh-huh. She apparently died in airstrike. But the kids, yeah. there's people who say they're alive, but then when they go interrogate people at the refugee camps, they right. get, oh, they're over there, oh, they're dead, and so now they're thinking they're alive. They're just being hidden. It's uh-huh. heartbreaking because this guy is like a, yeah. he's like a taxi driver or something. Like yeah. he, he's like a. Went on a trip f- to visit somebody and then comes back and his wife's like, well, you didn't want to join me. Kids are gone. Yeah. And, he, you know, he video chatted with them for a while. There's, there's, all, kinds the of the, there's all kinds of these stories. Horrifying. And unfortunately, that's just, uh, that's just the mess that ISIS left for yeah. everybody. So. Well, thanks, right for, on, man. thanks for doing your part Jordan. and help to clean it up. Thank man. you, man. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Cheers.